Um, our first afternoon speaker is Dr. Adam Farmer. Um, Adam and I go back a long way. Adam was my clinical research fellow for, for a few years. He was uh, researching on, on new mechanisms of visceral, visceral pain. Um, did some excellent work. And now he's a, he's a consultant in, I always forget Adam, University Hospital of North Midlands. I just know there's Stoke Hospital. Um, but we have a very strong academic research, research link. And Adam's going to give two back-to-back -back talks. One is on investigation, um, and the other one is on management of um, pseudo-obstruction. The reason why he's going to give back-to-back -back talks is that he needs to get back <laughs> home to the Midlands, which is the proud <laughs> father of a week old son. That's oh, right. Congratulations. So, congratulations. Uh, thanks, Kasten. That's a very kind introduction. I have to say before I, before I start, uh, what a great pleasure and honour it is to, to be here. Um, hearing some of the talks this morning, it uh, became abundantly apparent to me the, the bravery in this room. Moreover, it's not just the affected patients, it's their families as well. And I think sometimes as busy clinicians we can, we can sometimes forget that. So, yeah, as I said, it's a real uh, pleasure to, uh, to be here. Uh, my second thanks is to my co-speakers uh, this afternoon, as Cassim mentioned, uh, for changing the batting order uh, slightly. So this little chap uh, oh. came along uh, oh. last week, uh, weighing nine pounds, oh. two ounces. So um, my wife doesn't want me home too late. <laughs> so I think I've got a reasonably difficult uh, challenge this afternoon. Notwithstanding that it's uh, Friday afternoon and uh, uh, the weekend is upon us yet again, but also, actually, most of you now are postprandial. So all that blood that was going to your brain this morning is actually now being uh, diverted to your, to your gut so you can digest your lunch. So a little bit about what I'm going to talk. We'll first of all talk about the anatomy and the structure and the function uh, of the digestive tract. A few definitions around pseudo-structure. Then I'll go on to talk a little bit about the population statistics touch on the causes. Uh, Professor Aziz has discussed the symptoms already this morning and then I'll talk a little bit about the investigations that we've got and then finally end up on treatments and new treatments and things that are in the, the pipeline that might be of interest. So anatomy and function of the digestive tract. The digestive tract in essence is one long tube from top to bottom with a number of uh, valves uh, along its length and uh, a number of organs coming into that uh, tube. Would anyone like to hesitate a guess as to how long the digestive tract is? Sounds. Gentlemen here, sir. 26 feet. 26 feet, that's pretty good. They reckon about 30 feet, give or take, but it is variable uh, between people and certainly variable in patients with, uh, with pseudo obstruction. But despite it being essentially a a long tube. It has a, a, a structural and functional complexity uh, akin to that of the central nervous system. So there are a number of layers within the gastrointestinal tract. There's, a, there's an inner layer which uh, uh, comes into contact with the food and substances that you, that you eat in the diet. There's also a very large uh, blood supply that both provides blood to and drains blood away from and also a dual nerve supply. So, in essence, be, even though it's just a tube, in fact, it's very complex and performs a number of different, uh, different functions. Its main function, obviously, is to transport fluid, uh, food and fluid from the mouth through the stomach so it can be absorbed in the small and, and large intestine. So those nutrients can be extracted. This residue, or what's left over from this process of digestion, is then excreted out of your tail end. But we also know that the gut plays a very important, indeed central role in regulating the body, the process that we term homeostasis, but it also has an important role in regulating uh, the immune system uh, as well. So a few definitions I thought with that might be uh, quite helpful. So if there's dysmotility in the gut, the gut can be divided broadly into, into three segments, what we call the, the first part, or the foregut, the middle bit, the midgut, and the last third is, is what we refer to as the hindgut. And when we refer to dysmotility in the top of the gut, we refer to gastroparesis, or delayed emptying from the stomach, or delayed gastric emptying. And 
when we refer to the large bowel, it's intestinal steward obstruction. But the key fact that links both of these two disorders is that there isn't a mechanical blockage or a mechanical obstruction to explain uh, those symptoms. So how common is it? Well, I think we'd all agree here today that this is really a, a, a rare and, and, and an orphan disease. The um, European Commission on Public Health define orphan disease as life-threatening or chronically debilitating illnesses of which there is low prevalence that special combined efforts are needed to address them. And I think that's why events like today, in partnership with the professionals with the patients, in fact are so important in taking the field forward. The prevalence is reported to be about 1 in 2,000 of the population, and I would argue that most people go around undiagnosed, or indeed, as we heard from Richard earlier, uh, misdiagnosed for, for many years. Pseudo-obstruction itself is probably around uh, 1 in 5,000, and in terms of early or childhood onset versus adult onset, the ratio is probably about 1 to 3. There are very, uh, a number of differences between childhood and late onset. Early onset are generally genetic factors that usually present in childhood. There's marked widening or what we call dilation or dilatation of the digestive tract and it usually or frequently involves multiple segments so it can involve the stomach, the small bowel and the large bowel. And this has sadly a very high mortality rate of arguably around 50%. If we compare these to, to, to adults, some um, patients present following a, another cause. We heard a little bit about infections and particularly salmonella or Campylobacter. And usually in these patients, there's a lot of symptoms, but it doesn't always cause uh, significant uh, mortality. So a little bit about the causes. So there's, as I mentioned, early onset versus late onset. There are a number of uh, uh, rare causes here, including muscular dystrophy and cystic fibrosis. The late onset are the ones that we tend to see in our adult gastroenterology clinics. And I think probably the most frequent one that I see in my practice is dysmotility related to diabetes. So diabetes is a condition where the blood sugars are too high and that high blood sugars can damage the nerves that, that supply the bowel. More and more uh, we're seeing uh, problems with connective tissue diseases, uh, particularly around Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and, and uh, laxi uh, laxity of connective tissues, but also rarer causes related to, to radiation. <laughs> and indeed uh, Chagas disease, uh, which is common in uh, uh, South America. So what about the investigations? Well, I think we've got a number of investigations that we can, we can utilize to, to make the diagnosis. I think first and foremost is establishing that history and taking a good detailed history from the patient and indeed performing a, a clinical examination. These can be backed up with uh, um, uh, radiography, so x-rays or CT or MRI scanning, but uh, in more specialist centres such as here we have the option to do uh, manometry or pressure measurements through, through the gut and indeed more recently we now have a, uh, a, a wireless motility capsule which takes these pressure measurements as it uh, tumbles uh, through the digestive tract. Plain x-rays uh, with, uh, 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 with or without bearing can also be useful and these x-rays can show widening or dilation of the, uh, of the GI tract as you can see, see here. Essentially the barium shows up as white on an x-ray and it really allows you a, a slightly be better look rather than uh, depending on uh, air contrast here. So it allows you a more detailed uh, observation. These. Uh, um, techniques can be also um, uh, supplemented by using uh, MRI and certainly MRI techniques uh, have improved considerably uh, over the recent past such that you can see uh, adhesions on MRI and even uh, narrowings on, on MRI as well. So this is a very useful uh, technique that's beginning, beginning to become more readily available to us in clinical practice. This is what uh, a dilated uh, bowel looks like when you exteriorize it uh, at, at uh, surgery and as you can see here it looks taut, it looks shiny and I'd argue that in fact you wouldn't see this moving whereas in a normal or a healthy person you'd often see this uh, peristalsis or waves of contractions even when the bowel is exteriorized like it is here in this operation. Small bowel manometry can also be 
be very helpful and this is where a, a tube or what we term a catheter is passed through the nose, down the gullet, through the stomach and into the small bowel. And this allows you to measure pressure uh, along its length and uh, can be very useful in helping you to divide up whether the patient's symptoms are due to a nerve problem or what we call a neuropathy or due to a muscle problem, what we call a myopathy. Um, there's been a number of uh, studies published on, on this. The, the main difference in small bowel manometry in, in pseudo-obstruction is changing that uh, uh, nerve activity. But a number of uh, various abnormalities have, have been described here, uh, including um, problems with uh, the speed and coordination uh, of movements therein. The new kid on the block is the wireless motility capsule. Sadly, this is not available uh, yet on the, on the National uh, Health Service, but this essentially measures pressure, temperature and acidity as it uh, tumbles through the uh, uh, digestive tract. And I'm sure some of you have heard um, uh, of a wireless uh, endoscopy capsule, and this operates on a similar, similar principle. As you can see here, these red lines here allow you to see the, the pressure as it goes through uh, different areas of the uh, digestive tract. And I think this is one potential technology that, uh, that might be useful, uh, particularly in the future for, for making the diagnosis. Although, to the best of my knowledge as yet, it's not been studied in patients with uh, pseudo-obstruction. I think one of the key facets of making the diagnosis is, is getting a, a tissue sample. And certainly, um, before some of the work that I'm about to show you, largely people would take uh, what we call a mucosal biopsy, although this is a very superficial biopsy that can be done uh, with a camera, an endoscope, but it doesn't really give you the whole picture of what the bowel looks like through its different layers that I showed you uh, earlier. Whereas a, a full thickness biopsy, you bring the bowel out to the skin, and this can be done using keyhole surgery now, and you actually get a, a, a full chunk right through those layers of the bowel wall so you can really make this diagnosis. And certainly this is work that uh, um, Port had supported through uh, Professor Charles Knowles, who was really instrumental in conjunction with Professor Joe Martin, both based here at uh, Queen Mary, in really beginning to nail down and put a consensus and an agreement on what the features are to make the diagnosis of these, uh, these disorders. And this work culminated in the publication of the London uh, classification now back in 2009. And this has been really instrumental in helping us to divide up uh, patients into their underlying uh, causes. This is not just for academic interest, it also allows you to really find out what, what the problem is. So this was uh, some work uh, published by Professor Knowles in 2008 of 109 patients in whom he did full thickness biopsies. And as you can see, the majority here, 78%, had a nerve or a neuropathy-related uh, problem. Uh, and of those, uh, the majority were due to inflammation, um, but in some, approximately a quarter, there was degeneration of that uh, nerve supply uh, to the bowel. So this isn't just uh, of academic interest. This really uh, can profoundly change how we manage our, our patients. Moving now on to, on to treatments. I think the key treatment, actually, is developing that patient-doctor uh, partnership. If our patients don't trust us and buy into what we're trying to do, I think any treatment that, that we give our patients is unlikely to, to, uh, to succeed. And having that open conversation and discussing the potential benefits and moreover the risks of any treatment is actually key in that therapeutic relationship. I think closely following behind that relationship is, is nutrition and maintaining nutrition how, however that is, is done, whether that's via the, uh, the way nature intended or via a, a tube into the digestive tract, what we term enteral nutrition, or indeed in some patients you actually need to feed them directly into the, into the bloodstream via a, via a vein. You'll hear from Dr. Gallagher later on uh, this afternoon around uh, painkillers uh, I think these are certainly, if I can coin a term, a, a double-edged sword. I think in the short term they can be very helpful, but indeed in the long term, and particularly opiate uh, medications, can actually be uh, very unhelpful. 
There are a number of drugs out there to, to speed up the movement of the bowel. Certainly in our experience, these are uh, generally poorly tolerated and indeed uh, disappointing. Uh, antibiotics can be useful, particularly where there's uh, overgrowth of uh, bacteria within the, in a small bowel. Trying to suppress the immune system in, in a small number of certain cases can also be uh, somewhat helpful. Uh, surgery has a role, but in, in uh, very selected cases, and more of that uh, shortly. And I think things around psychological support and, and patient groups, and I think that's really where port uh, has an absolutely key role, not just in the, in the management of an individual patient, but you as a group, as a, as a community. Knowing, I think, for patients, particularly our younger patients, knowing that they're not alone, knowing that their symptoms aren't unique to them necessarily, is actually absolutely key and a critical facet, in my opinion, of, of successful management. I think with palliative care, we've got some way to go in, in terms of in improving that, uh, that um, um, interface. But certainly, I think, uh, and I'm sure you've read on the news this week, that palliative care in the UK is uh, amongst the, the best in the world. What about surgery for pseudo-obstruction? Well, this is uh, a quote from Professor Stangolini from, from Bologna, and I'll just read it to you if I, if I may. Uh, the elevated number of abdominal surgeries which characterizes the natural history of chronic intestinal pseudo-obstruction is sufficient by itself to demonstrate the impotence of traditional uh, surgical procedures. And I think that's really the key, the key thing uh, from, from this, is that in fact, surgery, I think, has a, has a limited role. And I'm pleased to see, I think, over the, since this review and over the recent past, that surgeries are becoming less common and only really done in, in absolute, uh, absolute need. I think there is a role for surgery around uh, diagnosis, sometimes with resection or, or bypass. Uh, surgery has a role around stoma or bag formation in order to facilitate feeding. In some patients, transplantation and uh, around neuromodulation. And we'll take each of these in, in turn now. I'm sure many patients in this room have, have presented to a, a local district general hospital um, before they had their formal diagnosis made and had what's called a, a laparotomy. This is where the surgeon under a general anaesthetic most commonly uh, has a little look inside the abdominal cavity, usually in using keyhole surgery. And frequently these are performed multiple times before a, before a diagnosis uh, is made. But I think more and more as technology advances, these are becoming uh, uh, avoidable uh, in that on an um, examination basis, you can't really differentiate uh, between mechanical, so if there's a, a physical blockage, or uh, a pseudo-obstruction. Um, each surgery becomes more difficult than the last. So each abdominal surgery that happens causes adhesions, whether um, the contents of the abdomen become stuck to one another. So each time a surgeon goes in, it becomes more difficult uh, than the last uh, operation. What about removal? Uh, what we refer to as resection or indeed uh, uh, bypassing areas of the gut. Well, I think we would all agree that, that its role is, is controversial. There was a very interesting uh, study published, uh, in fact today, um, from an American group looking at the role of um, a subtotal colectomy, whereas most of the large bowel is taken out for slow transit constipation. And actually at six months and three years, in fact, these patients didn't have a better quality of life and indeed they tended to have a worse quality of life. So I think the, the, uh, um, the case is, is limited at best for surgery. And uh, as, as I mentioned in that quote, I think surgery indeed is um, largely impotent in this, uh, in this uh, context. What about a stoma or, or, or a bag? Well, I think it probably has a greater role than resection uh, per se, and particularly it should be considered if patients are, are dependent on fluids going into their veins. It also can be useful for venting, so letting out gas to relieve that uh, abdominal distension and, and uh, discomfort. It could also be useful for, for feeding when particularly we think about a, a gastrostomy or a, or a peg tube. Particularly these can reduce vomiting and distension and pain and certainly can have a, a small but positive effect on speed of movements or what we refer to as transit.
So on to feeding. Well, feeding can be largely given in, in two manners. Um, so this is uh, uh, an endoscopic placed uh, peg or percutaneous uh, gastrostomy tube, which is passed through the, the skin of the uh, tummy wall directly into the stomach. And this can be more often uh, uh, done as a day case in, in an endoscopy unit. And these are done up and down the country. In some patients, it's not possible to do that uh, endoscopically and occasionally x-ray guidance is, is needed. In contrast, there's something called parenteral uh, uh, or total parenteral nutrition, and this is given uh, via vein, which we refer to um, as, a, as a Hickman line. But the problem with TPN is that these lines can get infected. When they get infected, that infection can travel directly into the bloodstream, and those complications can be life-threateningly serious because they can lead to a condition uh, known as septicemia. What about transplantation? Well, certainly um, pseudobstruction is now a recognised uh, indication, and for the uh, within the UK, approximately 8% of uh, intestinal transplants are performed for pseudobstruction now. There are several case series, both in, in children and indeed uh, adults, and its current indications are type 3 intestinal failure, so that's severe intestinal failure, patients who are dependent on TPN and who are getting uh, complications with TPN uh, around uh, infection. And if patients have lots of these Hickman lines that I mentioned earlier, then actually the veins can collapse on themselves and they can become more and more difficult to, uh, to put in. Uh, generally speaking, the average uh, graft and patient survival is around about 60%, which compares reasonably well to other indications for intestinal transplantation at two years. But certainly the survival probably isn't quite as good as, as TPN, so more often than not, uh, the advice is to try and continue on TPN uh, for as long as, as long as possible. Neuromodulation uh, is perhaps the, the, the new kid on the block. So there's a, a technique known as gastric electrical stimulation and this is not uh, dissimilar to having a, a heart pacemaker placed except the lead rather than going into the heart are placed into the stomach. These leads um, provide an electrical impulse which increases um, activity within the stomach. Although in fact the studies have shown it doesn't increase gastric emptying. It probably has an effect on, on symptoms and on the nerves that travel from the gut northbound uh, back to the brain. And there's one small study in uh, pseudobstruction uh, in four patients uh, suggesting, suggesting a small benefit. However, I would argue uh, uh, vigorously that uh, for a technology that costs around about £50,000 that we don't know how it works um, makes me think, actually, is this always a good idea uh, for, our, for our patients? Um, two other uh, options are sacral nerve simulation. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's not studied in pseudobstruction as yet, but it certainly has a, an effect in constipation, although that effect can be, can be variable. Uh, it certainly does improve uh, pain and, and distension um, and essentially the sacral nerve stimulation um, activates the or has needles which go into the nerves that come out towards the bottom of the spine. The spinal cord itself can be can be stimulated and certainly in, in animal studies uh, reduces pain responses when you uh, distend a, a, a balloon in the tail end of, of animals and it certainly has an established use in, in chronic pelvic pain. I think one of the, again, one of the really interesting uh, potential future therapies and something we're, we're pioneering here is modulating the vagus nerve. Vagus uh, is derived from the Latin meaning uh, wandering or, or variant, and essentially the vagus nerve supplies all of the uh, digestive tract except the last third of the large bowel. So it really is a, uh, a common sense target for, for neuromodulation. And recently there's been a, a handheld device that become, has become a commercially available which stimulates the vagus nerve uh, up in the neck and is certainly something that I think uh, uh, warrants further investigation, further investment in, in how we can uh, look at uh, the use and the indications for, for this technology which is patient delivered and patient friendly uh, in the future. So, ladies and gentlemen, in, in conclusion, I think we would all agree that uh, pseudobstruction is, is a rare, complicated, and indeed very heterogeneous uh, disorder.
Generally speaking, it's not great news. Uh, I think drug treatments are largely ineffective, but certainly that doctor-patient relationship and nutritional support is, is absolutely key in, in improving outcomes. I think neuromodulation is a really exciting new treatment uh, for the future, but uh, uh, as a physician, I can com confidently say this, so uh, we should avoid uh, surgery in general. And if I may leave you with, uh, with two final, final thoughts, perhaps uh, many of our patients have uh, uh, thousands of stools in, in stock, but uh, perhaps uh, Harry Potter does indeed have the, uh, have the answer. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>